Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today's session. My name is Caitlin. Um, I'm an intern at DLTV, and I'll be moderating for today. Um, and today's session is entitled Breaking Barriers and Advancing Access Through the Courts, DLCV's Legal Successes. And our presenter today is Becca Herbig, um, JD, MSW, uh, Director of Litigation and Institutional Rights Unit Manager at Disability Law Center of Virginia. Um, before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping rules that we'd like to address. Um, speakers, please remember that we are using live captioning and interpreting services. When you first introduce yourself today, whether it be as a speaker or as a participant later on, please include a physical description of yourself and your preferred pronouns, such as I am a white woman with straight brown hair and glasses. I'm wearing a teal floral blouse and have the DLCB Summit blue background. My preferred pronouns are she, her. Um, this will help provide some context for our attendees who may be blind or vision impaired and will also help our interpreters and captioners locate who's speaking on the screen. Um, please stay muted at all times unless you're the speaker and please hold all questions until the end. We do have a chat box that will be monitored, uh, monitored by myself and the chat box is used for questions only or as directed by the session speaker. Um, at the end of each session, I will select some questions from the chat box and there we go. Um, if your question's chosen, you may take yourself off of mute and ask your question or simply type your question in the question box. Um, so now I will hand it over to Becca for today's presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a good lunch break and that you're enjoying our summit so far. My name is Becca or Rebecca Herbig. Um, I am DLCV's Director of Litigation. I'm a middle-aged white woman with brown hair that is short on one side and a little above my shoulder on the other side. I wear glasses. Um, I am in front of the DLCV Summit background, and I use the pronouns she and her. I want to talk to you today about some of the legal work that we do here um, at DLCV. I guess technically all of our work is legal work, but I want to tell you really more about our litigation work. And um, so you all are on the systemic track today attending this session. And we do at DLCV, we do provide individual services for folks, but we also want to make sure that we are providing and doing as, as much advocacy and as large scale advocacy as we can. And so we also like to to make sure that we balance that individual casework with our systemic work. And a lot of that work can happen through the legislature, as you all heard this morning, if you attended the session with Colleen and Jason. And some of that work also happens in the courtroom or in administrative hearings. And so I will be talking to you about courtroom uh, work and administrative hearings today. So our litigation program encompasses three separate types of activities. One of those activities is called amicus briefs. Some lawyers will say amicus, some say amicus. Amicus curiae is Latin for friend of the court. That is essentially a brief of a non-party to a lawsuit but it's somebody who maybe has some way that they, something they can educate the court about. They wanna make sure that the court understands one of the legal issues because it's really important to that particular agency. And so we participate in this program. We, uh, every now and again, will submit a brief to a court and we will explain an issue of disability law to the court. And usually this is on a large scale issue that we expect will have an impact on a large number of folks. And we'll give an example of that later today. Um, we also included in the litigation program are the administrative hearings that we do. And to be clear, not all of those administrative hearings have to be done by an attorney. So we'll talk about an example of that and some work that one of our great advocates did here. And then, of course, we've got in-court litigation. So that's when, you know, DLCV will find uh, certain plaintiffs who maybe have experienced discrimination or uh, other disability rights issues and file a lawsuit in uh, court. 
We have five attorneys who regularly handle legal matters for clients. And the legal program, actually, we created our own vision. We want to be recognized by the community and the courts as a persistent advocate for independence, self-determination, and equality of opportunities for Virginians with disabilities. So I'm going to start off by talking about the amicus briefs that um, we have worked on. Um, some of you may be aware of the Department of Justice settlement with the state, but I'm going to give a little bit of background on that just in case you aren't very familiar with it. There are facilities in Virginia that are called ICF IIDs. Those are intermediate care facilities for individuals with developmental disabilities. And those facilities are funded by Medicaid. Virginia actually operated five of these facilities as state training centers is what they called them. Um, Central, Southeastern, Southwestern, Northern, and Southside. And at the time, they housed about a thousand residents between those five training centers. Well, in 2008, the Department of Justice had gotten some complaints about Central Virginia Training Center and the fact that so many people were being essentially housed there and not being provided services in the community. So they opened an investigation and based on the findings there, they actually expanded their investigation to all five training centers in Virginia. As a result of that investigation, the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against the state of Virginia and made an allegation that the state of Virginia was not providing appropriate placements and services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the community. Eventually, in 2012, Virginia agreed to a settlement that's estimated to cost the state about $2.1 billion. As part of that settlement, the um, state agreed to close all but one of the training centers. So the only remaining training center is Southeastern Virginia Training Center. That's in Chesapeake, Virginia. And there are only about 75 residents, which is a really big shift from the thousand residents that were being housed previously. Um, Virginia also agreed to increase appropriate community placements and services for individuals. They did that through providing more waivers. They also did that by creating a library of data about its programs and services that's available on its website. But the enforcement of this case, even though it was settled in 2012, the enforcement of this case is still going on. The Commonwealth has not come into line with all of the indicators that they are required to um, in order to reach the settlement agreement that they agreed to. And so the, the concern at this point in time is that court oversight of this settlement agreement is scheduled to end in December of this year. And so there's a lot of question about what happens with the fact that the state hasn't already complied with the settlement. And even for places where they have complied, how do we make sure the state continues to comply with the settlement once the court isn't involved anymore? Over the years, um, uh, the 11 years that this case has been in front of the court, we've submitted many amicus briefs um, explaining the Commonwealth's progress and how those their progress has impacted um, our constituents and our clients. In July of this year, we submitted our most recent amicus brief, and it actually looked at the library that I told you about that's on the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services website, and it did a quality review of that to kind of see, you know, are all of the documents up there that are supposed to be posted up there, are they posted in a way that's easily accessible and understandable for, uh, you know, the citizens of Virginia to be able to review. And then we also urge the court to either continue enforcing the settlement agreement beyond December of this year, or to appoint an independent agency who will monitor and that continued compliance with the settlement agreement. Um, the most recent uh, activity in this case 
was in late July, there was a status conference and there is a hearing coming up in December where the judge has indicated potential uh, liability of the state for sanctions based on failure to come into compliance with the settlement agreement. So our, our biggest concern right now with the case is that if the court oversight ends and there's no independent agency monitoring, that the state will simply have no incentive to continue toward the markers that they haven't met or to maintain compliance. I'm also going to talk a little bit about a case um, that we did another amicus brief in called Kincaid versus Williams. Um, that is a case where Keisha Williams, she was a she is a transgender woman who was placed in a men's prison in Virginia, and the prison denied her the medical care that she needed at, because she was diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Miss Williams sued the state, alleging violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. The trial court dismissed the case and said, look, there's this exclusion in the Americans with Disabilities Act and in Section 504 that says you are not considered to have a disability if you have these certain conditions. And I, one of the conditions is gender identity disorders not resulting from physical impairments. So essentially back in 19, I think 1980, um, when the ADA was passed, there were some concerns about some conditions that some senators and Congress uh, individuals believed were detrimental to society or that had a stigma attached to it. So there was um, success from a small group of very conservative um, lawmakers who wanted to exclude from the definition of disability transsexualism, pedophilia, exhibitionism, voyeurism, gender identity, identity disorders not resulting from physical impairments, and other sexual behaviors. So essentially the question before the court, if you'll remember, Ms. Williams had gender dysphoria. So the question becomes for the court, does gender, is gender dysphoria the same thing as gender identity disorders not resulting from physical impairments that would be excluded, or is it something different that would be included in the definition of disability? We uh, actually reached out very um, carefully to a number of LGBTQ plus uh, advocacy organizations. Um, to talk with them about what their thoughts were and 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 what arguments might be in line with their movement. You know, we are not uh, an organization, you know, we have expertise in disability rights, but not in other types of rights. And we really didn't want to stampede on, you know, anything that would be out of line with what the movement um, was looking for. And so after talking with them, we decided that we would submit an, an, an amicus brief on on behalf of Ms. Williams that essentially argued that gender dysphoria is a completely separate clinical condition from gender identity disorders. In 1990, when the ADA was passed, um, gender dysphoria was not a diagnosis. Um, it didn't exist. But in the Diagnos Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, there was a category for gender identity disorders. And essentially what that meant is that there was an incongruence between assigned sex and gender identity. Now in 2013, some many years after the ADA is passed, the new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual came out, and that's DSM-5. It actually removed gender identity disorder. Hey guys, did the audio cut out for you guys as well? Okay, 
I will check in with Becca. It seems like there might have just been a little internet issue. Give us just a second. Everyone just give us a few minutes. We are going to check in with our presenter and see if we can get her back on. Just hold tight. I made it back. I'm so sorry. My internet completely shut down. Let me share my screen again. Okay, so we were talking about gender dysphoria and um, the, the uh, disabilities. So um, we submitted that amicus brief that I was talking about, arguing that these are two totally separate conditions two totally separate diagnoses. Not every single person who has a gender identity disorder has gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is a clinical condition. In December of 2021, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals um, agreed with DLCV and actually used a lot of the language that we used in our amicus brief in its order. And it remanded the case back to the trial court for proceedings. Kincaid was not satisfied, though, and petitioned the Fourth Circuit to hear the case, what's called en banc. That means I want to have all the judges here. Usually in an appeal, they'll select a panel of three judges that will hear from all the judges that are there. But you can petition the court basically for a rehearing by all the judges. And on October 7th of, uh, let's see, on October seventh of last year, the court denied that petition. So Kincaid, still unsatisfied, appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States. They actually denied the appeal, which means that the Fourth Circuit's decision is still in place. And this is really important. I don't know if any of you attended one of the other sessions today that was about um, gender dysphoria and that, that talked about this case a little bit in some of the other cases, but this is the only circuit in the country that has made this decision. And so when the Supreme Court looks at an issue that is a novel issue, it, it, it will decide, is this something we really want to disturb or not? And so it looked at this issue and it said, no, we don't, which basically means that what the first Fourth Circuit says goes for the Fourth Circuit and is really great precedent for anybody in any other circuit. As I told you, we also do administrative hearings. So I'm gonna tell you about one of the cases that we had. Um, there are human rights regulations that are set forth by the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. And there's a complaint process in there. And basically you can make a complaint to the director of any facility or program about any violations of the human rights regulations. And as part of that complaint, if you don't like what the director says back to you, essentially the director has to look into the issue and get back to you, let you know, did abuse and neglect happen? And are they going to make any changes based on what happened with you? If you don't like what the director has to say, there's actually an appeal you can make to a volunteer-based board or committee called the Local Human Rights Committee. And if you're not satisfied with the decision they make on that, you can actually appeal to what's called the State Human Rights Committee, which is statewide. You don't have to be a lawyer to represent a client in this forum. And so we very often have our advocates handling these cases. So one of the advocates on the institutional rights unit um, was contacted by the guardian of Stacy, who was inpatient at Western State Hospital. The Guardian reported that Stacy had been placed in seclusion for disruptive behavior. Now, that's really important because the human rights regulations talk about when somebody can be put in seclusion or restrained. And you can be put in seclusion in a state hospital if it is an emergency. And the way emergency is defined is that there's a threat to yourself or to someone else. 
And so disruptive behavior, we have argued successfully throughout the years, does not rise to the level of a threat to yourself or someone else. But the Guardian says, nonetheless, Western State Hospital placed her in seclusion, and she had uh, submitted a human rights complaint on behalf of um, her ward, and she never heard back. So we agreed to represent the woman. We advocated for a response to that human rights complaint. We got a response. The director said, nope, no abuse happened. We, we um, aren't going to do anything different. We're completely satisfied with what happened. Well, of course, the guardian wasn't satisfied. And so we agreed to represent the client in an appeal to the local human rights committee. The local human rights committee after hearing our appeal found that Western State Hospital did indeed violate Stacy's right to have her human rights complaint reviewed, investigated, and responded to. And in addition, it found that by placing her Stacy in what they called open seclusion, which was a seclusion room with an open door, but a staff member standing at the door, not allowing you to leave, for disruptive behavior that didn't rise to the level of threatening behavior, they said, yep, that's abuse. That's a pretty good outcome. But we weren't completely satisfied because there were a couple of other allegations of abuse and neglect that um, we found that we still wanted a ruling on that the, the local human rights committee did not rule for us on. So we agreed to appeal to the state human rights committee, and we actually ended up with a finding of abuse or neglect for every single allegation that was brought against Western State Hospital. And we advocated for some corrective action. And so some corrective action that happened was that the staff, had, there was a staff curriculum developed with the local REACH program to talk about how to communicate with and um, de-escalate individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities, retraining staff on how to use seclusion and restraint and how to identify pain in individuals that have communication difficulties and the development of sensory rooms for individuals with developmental disabilities. So the last area that we have to talk about is litigation. So one of the cases we're going to talk about is about our access authority. We have some pretty unique access authority that allows us to look at the medical records of someone who's been alleged to have been abused, neglected, or exploited. So when a person with a significant mental illness or emotional impairment dies, DLCV is afforded access to all records after it receives a complaint of abuse or neglect. I'm sure that many of you have heard about the death of Mr. Otieno at Central State Hospital earlier this year. We, of course, learned of that through the news, and it showed that released videotape showed approximately 13 individuals that consisted of both police and Central State Hospital staff that got on top of Mr. Otieno while he was prone on the floor in an attempt to restrain him in the admission suite. As a result of those 13 folks being on top of him, Mr. Otieno died of asphyxia. Um, when we received a complaint about this, we reached out to various medical providers to ask for medical records. Now, there's a long story of how Mr. Otieno got to Central State Hospital. To make it short, at one point in time, while he was under an emergency custody order and a temporary detention order was pending, he was at Parham Doctors Hospital, which is run by HCA of Virginia. So we asked for the records from Parham Doctors Hospital because we were interested in his treatment while he was there. After numerous requests for records and several phone calls, we did not receive a written response from them. We did not receive any records. The PAMI statute, and we get different grants, federal grants here at DLCV, and one of those is called PAMI. That's Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness. That's what gives us this access authority in this particular case. It requires that providers provide a written statement if they're going to deny access. So we didn't get that. 
Um, on April 17th of this year, we sent a courtesy copy of a complaint that we were going to file in the Eastern District of Virginia two days later to let them know that we were serious and we did intend to get copies of these records. We didn't hear back, and so two days later, as we said we would, we filed the complaint. Two days after that, counsel for HCA actually sent an email to me and heard about what happened and wanted to make sure that we got the records, got them into our hands um, two days later. And so we went ahead and dismissed the case. So it, it kind of sounds like, you know, not a whole lot happened, but if this is really important because there are a lot of investigations that we do that really rely on our access authority. And, you know, so it's very important that when someone does not respond to our access requests, that we actually follow up on those and get the records and get the information that we are entitled to. So we are willing to go to court on these types of cases if we need to. Um, so a lot of the other work that we do, so um, a, a fair amount of our litigation, I would say maybe 30% to 50% of it is actually guardianship revocation removal or um, trying to not have someone have a guardian appointed. We've got two attorneys that do that work for us. Um, and we are actually one of the few legal organizations in the state that provides legal services to these individuals to help them remove their guardian. Very often, this means that they have to have a capacity evaluation done that would show a court that that person has capacity to make decisions. For some folks, in addition, we actually prepare a advanced directive, an advanced healthcare directive, or a supported decision making plan to help show the court, look, this person is well supported, they have systems in place in case an emergency arises, such that they will be able to make sure that appropriate decisions are made for them, therefore they don't need a guardian. We recently handled a case that I actually thought really illustrates our interdisciplinary work very well. You know, it's an interesting organization to be at a legal organization where the vast majority of the um, employees are not lawyers. And um, so it's really important that we all learn how do we communicate together and how as an interdisciplinary team do we work together. So one of our advocates, who's a social worker, had been to a day program visiting some clients, and she saw a former client who let her know, by the way, my mom is trying to get guardianship over me, and she was really concerned about it. She didn't want her mom to be her guardian, and we were a little concerned about it, too, because we've worked with this individual previously, and she had some goals that her mother wouldn't support, like she wanted to live independently, she wanted to have a job, and her mother said she wasn't able to do those things. Our advocate came back to the office and talked with one of the attorneys that I told you handles our guardianship work. Um, this attorney is actually a dual lawyer and social worker, and they wanted to make sure to protect this client. So she got in touch with our director of legal services, me, and the manager of our communities unit, and we all sat down to talk about this. And after probably about 30 minutes of kind of talking about what the pros and cons were and, and, and um, what the outcome might be, we decided that we would move forward with this case and representing this client. I thought it was pretty cool because the group was comprised of two dual lawyer social workers, a lawyer and two social workers. And so we decided to find out, is there a way maybe, because this is the hard part, those capacity evaluations I told you about can be really expensive. So we wanted to see if there was a way that we could find a way for the state to pay for that. And we actually did. The manager of our community use unit was able to reach out to the state and they were willing to do that, which was absolutely amazing. We entered an appearance in the case on behalf of our former client. And the unfortunate part of this story is that the capacity evaluation did not go so well. And it showed that the former client lacked capacity. So we couldn't really move forward with this case. But before we could do anything, we got a phone call from the lawyer for the mother and learned that the mother was going to be withdrawing the petition for guardianship. And so we ended up getting a result for the client that was exactly what the client wanted. 
And we were able to take a team of folks who came at it from different angles. Some had experience with this client previously, some did not. We, we figured out how to get stuff paid for that was tough to get paid for. And it all worked out for the client. Not all of our cases are this quick. A lot of times um, with guardianship revocation cases or protection against guardianship cases, you do have to go to hearings. There will be testimony by doctors about the capacity of the individual. I'm going to talk to you real quick about a case um, called Guestwick versus the Independent Capacity System, Inc. and Independent Homes, Inc. We got a call from an individual who provides positive behavioral support facilitation services as an independent contractor, and she was barred from bringing her service animal into the group homes where she provided services. Well, this service dog helps her retrieve items from the ground, supports her in her movement, and supports her in getting up from a seated position. So she needed this dog in order to be able to provide these services. We tried to get a response from the group home, sent them, some, sent them mail, sent them an email, even hand delivered a letter to them. However, they did not respond at all to us. None of that was successful. And we had to file a lawsuit in Chesterfield County against the group home in order to hopefully get a response. As it turns out, even to the court, the group home failed to respond. And so they were what is called to be found in default. That essentially means this person made this allegation against you. We gave you 21 days to come in and respond to that and let us know legally why you're not responsible, but you failed to even come in and answer to the court. So we're going to enter a ruling that the plaintiff wins. And so we did get an injunction issued against the group home, requiring them to permit the plaintiff to enter the group home with her service animal. And we're working right now on getting damages for the client. She missed um, uh, some income as a result of having not been able to go into the group home and to visit her clients. And we're also looking for attorney's fees there. And I have one last case that I want to tell you all about. This is a, a pretty big one. Um, we are currently involved in litigation in the federal courts um, in the National Federation of the Blind of Virginia versus the Department of Corrections. We worked with Brown Goldstein Levy and the UC, ACLU, excuse me, of Virginia um, to conduct a six month investigation into whether inmates in the Virginia Department of Corrections who are blind or have low vision are being provided with effective communication. Our investigation showed many issues. I think that we interviewed something like 30 different um, inmates. M both of them, most of them were at uh, Deerfield um, Correctional Center or Greensville Correctional Center, where they, it seems, to tend to house folks who are blind or have low vision. And so because it, our investigation showed a lot of issues, we ended up filing a lawsuit on behalf of the Nettle National Federation of the Blind of Virginia and seven of the individuals that we talked about. And we made claims under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Rehabilitation Act, the Virginians with Disabilities Act, and the Eighth Amendment. So essentially, during our investigation, we found that blind and low in vision inmates were treated very differently than other inmates. For example, there were educational programs. Folks can get their GED. Folks can take college classes. But there were no aids provided to any of the inmates that were blind or had low vision that would allow them to read the textbooks that they had. Um, a lot of times folks would have to rely on their caretaker or just a random inmate to sit and read these textbooks aloud to them. Um, that's not really effective communication. That's not really fair to, to, to put somebody else out to have to help read those materials. And often that actually puts inmates in a really dangerous situation because a lot of inmates are not going to do something for free for somebody else. So a lot of times there will be a trade of commissary or something like that to help a blind or low vision inmate do something um, that other inmates are able to do. 
We also found that they were not allowing caretakers to attend um, classes with these inmates. Um, in the Department of Corrections, uh, most folks have to have a job and they're, one of the jobs they have is as caretaker. So they do provide a caretaker who does provide some assistance to a blind or low vision inmate, but that person would not be allowed to attend class with them, which would make things difficult. The work programs, we found that a lot of blind and low vision inmates were either not provided work opportunities or only were provided the lower paid work opportunities with no means of advancement. And then communication. So, of course, you know, you've got orientation materials, you might need a medical appointment, so you might have to use a medical request form. If you've got an issue or a complaint, you're going to need a grievance form. If you want to order commissary, you've got to fill out a little scantron with bubbles on a commissary sheet. And all of these are provided in a non-accessible format. There's no large print font available. There is no... Um, technology that allows them to do a text to speech or something like that. Um, all of the inmates actually have these uh, JP6 uh, tablets and the tablets we found out actually do have a program that allows text to speech that would be really great. That would mean these inmates would be able to hear all of their emails that come in, be able to hear um, other things that they are working on on those tablets, but the Department of Corrections has decided they don't need that software. So in this case, we're currently in discovery. Um, we had a hearing in August. Some of the defendants have made motions to dismiss certain claims that we made. We're still waiting to get a response from the court on that. It's been about five weeks. So I expect that we should get ruling soon. Um, what's coming up is we are taking the deposition of Barry Morano. He is the ADA coordinator for the Department of Corrections. We're taking his deposition next Tuesday, and we're scheduled for trial in this case in May of 2024. So that's all I have for you all today. Thank you for hanging with me through my technical difficulties. I really appreciate it. And I hope this was informative, and I'm really looking forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, just to go over some messages that were shared earlier in the chat, a lot of encouragement and support um, during the connection break. Um, and then a thank you um, from Karen Rhodes for um, DLCB's arrangement of the interpreters for the summit. Um, so thank you so much for the support, Karen. Um, and then Karen has a um, comment as well, deaf inmates have issues too. That's absolutely true, Karen. You're absolutely right. And, you know, we have to be careful, of course, of how we utilize our resources, but that is an issue that's really important to us right now is effective communication in any type of facility. So we are looking for that work. And actually, we've got some special projects coming up in um, our new fiscal year, which starts in October. So very <laughs> soon, uh, having to do with effective communication for either blind or deaf um, individuals. Awesome. And um, while we wait for some more questions to roll in, Karen said, great. Um, I do have a few um, for you, Becca. Um, so a question about um, the training centers. So in closing the training centers, what types of places or areas in the community were individuals with disabilities relocated to? So that's a really great question. Um, a lot of these individuals, uh, I would say there are two major placements that these individuals have. They're either able to live in a home with family or other caretakers um, and now have services in the community that give them everything they need. Or a lot of those folks um, moved into group homes in the state of Virginia. Those are licensed by the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services as well, but they're not operated by the state. They're operated by private providers. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and then a question about the case regarding transgender rights. 
um, with the transgender rights movement and policy debates being discussed among state and federal, federal levels, um, has ULCV noticed a subsequent rise in human rights issues being reported? Um, and if so, what are some of those conversations that are being had or steps being taken to address the growing issue? That's a good question too. Um, it, it does feel like these days, right? I mean, there, there's so much going on and there's so much conflict um, and there's so much debate and back and forth. And I don't feel like that though has led to us getting more complaints in about violations. I'll tell you, we get a lot of complaints and we, we always have. Um, uh, uh, the complaints that we get, especially when we're talking about things like violations of the human rights regulations, the example that I gave um, that talk that that where they didn't the the director just didn't respond to the human rights complaint that's actually something we find happens really regularly and so we regularly provide services to folks to go in and make sure that they get their appellate rights and that they can do what they need to do um, and are afforded due process essentially but i don't feel like i've seen an uptick okay thank you so much for that and the messages from Karen again in the chat. Um, we have the Virginia Department um, for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing are working in reaching places that does not provide accommodations. And we welcome any resources and partnerships to make things happening for the deaf, hard of hearing, and deafblind communities. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate it. I know we'll reach out to you when we need you. So. And I'm um, still keeping an eye out in the chat for any questions, but I have um, just one more for you, Becca. Um, so where can um, more information and resources be found about guardianship and um, who can people reach out to with questions about guardianship and the process for pursuing independent living? Yeah, so that's a good question as well. So um, I think that you know, we are here. We provide information and referral to every single person with a disability that contacts us with the question. And we might be able to provide more services in that, you know, we might be able to provide short term assistance or an investigation, or even legal representation, but at the very minimum, we're going to provide you with information and referral. And so that will always make sure that you can get to those right resources. So you can reach out to us. Actually, the best way to do that is through our get help form on our website, our websites, www.dlcv.org. And actually, if you want to go straight to the get help, it's backslash get help. And you can fill that form out. It's monitored every day as uh, the forms come in and they are assigned out to what we call our subject matter experts. So if you had a question about guardianship and you call you, you put in a get help request form, you would get assigned to either talk to Dana Trainum or Michael Gray. Those are our two attorneys that handle our guardianship work. And they would be happy to walk through the process with you of things like how do I remove my guardian? Guardian? How do I make sure I don't have a guardian? They even do our work having to do with advanced healthcare directives and supported decision making so they could walk you through that information as well. And if you decide that you wanted representation for those things, you would absolutely be able to ask them for that too. So I think it's a great idea to call us at the minimum, you're going to get pointed in the right direction. Awesome, thank you so much, Becca. And we have the Get Help form link um, on DLCV's website in the chat for anyone who may need it. Um, but I'm not seeing any other questions or comments. Um, so I think we are good to go for today. So thank you so much, Becca, for your presentation um, on all DLCV's litigation highlights. And thank you to everyone who joined for today's session. And we hope to see you for our last and our um, conclusion speaker for the rest of the evening. Take care.